Michael Whitby. Uh, Michael's dad, by the way, not to uh, upstage him, but Michael's dad was one of the, uh, I think, very original Canadian uh, RCN, uh, RCN uh, pilots. You know, in the Shearwater, in the, the early days of the RCN fleet era. And um, Michael himself is a uh, senior naval historian with the uh, Department of History and Her Heritage and History with the uh, Department of National Defense. So uh, he's going to be sharing some new insights he has on the uh, events that took place during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, so, uh, Michael, the stage is all yours. Thank you. Thanks, Don. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. It really is. Uh, as a son of a naval leader, an aviator, I like talking about aircraft and ships and stuff like that. And I'd like to thank Matt Yost for suggesting this and Don for putting it together. In October 1962, I was an eight-year-old brat living at HMCS Shearwater outside of Dartmouth. Feedback. Um, I remember three things of October 1962. I didn't see my father very often for about three weeks. My mother and other adult friends were very, very concerned, although not so much my mother. She was British and had been through the Second World War and had bombs land on her farm, so she was concerned, but not as much as others. And I remember sitting in Sir, Sir Hampton or Sir Hampton Gray Memorial School in Shearwater doing air raid drills hiding under my desk next to a great big plate glass window. <laughs> so uh, I don't think it was very good. What I'm going to talk about tonight is based upon research for Volume 3 of the Official History of the Royal Canadian Navy, which runs from 45 to 68. And this material will also run into Volume 4 of the RCAF Official History covering the same period, because a lot of this is maritime air. I, my colleague Jason Delaney did a lot of the initial research, and I picked it up. All the interpretations you're going to hear tonight are mine, so yell at me, please, not him. My main intent is to update new stuff we've found about Maritime Command's role in the crisis, and I'm going to focus on Atlantic Command just for periods of time. And I want, I'm going to provide some clarity to what is already known, because there's some stuff already out there. There are some significant divergences from these accepted versions, and you are the first public audience to hear them, so I'm interested in your feedback, I truly am. I'm going to talk about this, the command and control situation between Ottawa, Halifax, and Norfolk. I'm going to talk about the threat in Canadian Ocean areas during the crisis. I'm going to talk about the response by Atlantic Command, and then do some takeaways. I'm not going to talk about the messy political process in Ottawa and Washington, especially Ottawa. I'm not going to talk about Pacific Command and USN quarantine operations, sorry Glenn. If you want to ask me questions about Pacific Command, I know it very well, so please do. And I'm not going to get into alerts and NORAD, although we'll have to talk about NORAD because that's important context to what went on. The historical record for all this, and this is really important to understand, is really, really spotty. All the operational records related to Atlantic Command in the Cuban Missile Crisis have been destroyed. Okay? We've looked and looked and looked and looked, not just me, but my colleagues, archivists, everybody. Uh, we think it was General or Admiral Brock who ordered them destroyed. I'll explain why I think that happened throughout. So when you're doing operational history, which this is, you tend to want to see the operational instructions and the after-action reports. There are none. Okay? Now, through various situation reports, we can still piece together what happened. But what we're missing is operational motives precisely stated. Moreover, the Americans have closed everything up. And I'll give you a quick example. Uh, the report of the Commander Sackland, who ran the maritime operations of the United States Navy during uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis, was open until after 9-11. It's been cited in books. It is now closed, and you cannot see it. Uh, we destroyed all our copies so we can't find it here. I have to go to Washington to, to look at it. I cannot cite it. I cannot quote it. I have to sign my life away to the United States government just to see it. Okay? When I looked at it, I had a minder with me all day. Okay? It came back in the diplomatic pouch. Okay? So I, my guess would be, and I'm going to keep knocking on this door, that Admiral Dyer, as I'll talk about, sent copies of stuff to Norfolk. I'm certain of that. And I'm hoping we might be able to get that stuff through the Americans because we've destroyed it. Okay? 
and the Soviets. Um, there is some pretty good stuff being written. Uh, it's, there's not a lot of it. There's some very flawed oral accounts, but there's some, some uh, a few academic papers that are quite good, but there's some wonderful stuff on the CIA website of their appreciations and their I'm going to say understanding, but it's more than that, the, the actual documents. Anyways, they've released a lot of Soviet stuff in that period on the CIA website. It's very, very valuable. And now let's get at it. So, command and control. This is the basic setup. National Naval Service Headquarters in Ottawa, the Land Command HQ in Halifax, SAC Land in Norfolk, and also the Pentagon. And I put a little shaded arrow there because the Pentagon talked to Ottawa, the naval commanders there, but not very often, but that link was there. There was no link between our headquarters in Ottawa and Norfolk. There was no link between Atlanta Command Halifax and the Pentagon. Okay? So that's the basic command and control setup. Rear Admiral Ken Dyer was a flag officer for Atlantic Coast and Ken Conmar Land. So he commanded maritime aviation and all the RCM resources on Atlantic Command out of Halifax. He described this as exceptional circumstances, and he handled it master, masterfully. There's no question about it. He was an old sea dog, brilliant Second World War career, very solid naval officer, um, has flown under the radar, I think, in terms of public recognition and understanding of him, except for this one in that episode. His deputy maritime commander was always RCAF. It was Bill Clements. Worked very, very closely with Dyer. I know for a fact when there were phone calls going back and forth to Ottawa, they were both on the phone. Uh, there's no evidence of any friction between the two commanders. I think uh, Clement's uh, successor, uh, Carpenter, there was huge friction with the naval commander. I'm not sure whose fault that was, but with Dyer and Clements, it wasn't the case. Now, the Halifax Norfolk link is critical. Okay? So under U.S. Canadian bilateral agreements and NATO agreements, we work seamlessly. We share work plans. Okay? So we knew what we were going to do when the balloon went up. We were going to work very closely together. The Dyer's main contact was around Admiral Whitey Taylor, who was the commander of ASW force in the U.S. Atlantic Fleet under Norfolk. And they got along very well. Taylor came up to Shearwater uh, the day before Kennedy announced the crisis. And they talked about, all we know, again, no reports, they talked about operational circumstances. That's all we know about that meeting. Uh, staff from Halifax shuttled back and forth to Norfolk during the crisis. Dyer went down there at least twice. So these guys are talking all the time. Okay? Interesting thing, uh, there was no hotline. One of the first things they did after the crisis was make a hotline connection between Norfolk and Halifax headquarters. Command and Control Ottawa. And this is where it starts to get a little controversial. The Minister of National Defense, Douglas Harkness, and the Chairman of the Chiefs of Staff, Air Marshal Frank Miller, oversaw the overall defense effort. Okay, that's the Chiefs of Staff Committee. Harkness doesn't sit on that, but um, Miller's the chair. Uh, the Chief of Naval Staff of Vice Admiral Rayner. During the crisis, he looked at strategic focus. So he dealt with the Americans in the Pentagon. He dealt with the Chiefs of Staff. He dealt with Harkness. He dealt with Deacon Baker only on one issue, I think, and that was on Law of the Sea about the quarantine versus blockade. Vice Chief of Naval Staff was Rear Admiral Jeffrey Brock. He looked after the tactical, tactical focus. An ops center was set up in Naval Headquarters in Ottawa, as it was an Air Force Headquarters in Ottawa. And that doesn't mean he ran the operations on the coast, but he would be asking Dyer, what do you need? Okay. So he's juggling maintenance schedules and things like that, uh, deciding any tactile things that have to be explained around headquarters in Ottawa. Okay. So they're pretty important people. Now, this is the, I'm going to call it the myth. Um, there are claims that Naval Service Headquarters was frozen with inaction during the crisis. That's a direct quote from Peter Hayden and Mark Milner. Uh, in fact, as I'll show you, both RCN and RCF headquarters were fully involved in the handling of the crisis. Dyer sent daily situation reports as well as signals detailing operational movements, including cooperation with United States forces. Daily. 
These went throughout Naval Service Headquarters, which I'll show you. They also went to the minister and the associate minister. So to claim that that, that Dyer is isolated and being left to his own devices and that uh, Naval Service Headquarters and the Ottawa military is shaking in their boots and don't want to do anything it is just false. Okay? And this, the way this was set up also gave political top cover to Dyer, and I think that becomes important. So here's what I'm talking about. This is a typical sit rep that went from Dyer to Ottawa. Okay, now you can't read that, but you can read this. Okay, so up there, so it's from, that's the Halifax headquarters, that's another Halifax headquarters, the sub headquarters. It's from them, it's on the 26th of October at 1848 Zulu, it's Canadian Naval Headquarters and Canadian Air Headquarters in Ottawa. If you go across here, you'll see the distribution within Naval Headquarters. It goes to the Chief of Naval Staff, it goes to the Vice Chief of Naval Staff, it goes to the two uh, Associate Chiefs, it goes to the Controller, because they're keeping tabs of money, okay, which we'll get to, it goes to the Director of Naval Intelligence, it goes to the minister, MIN, it goes to the associate minister. Okay, so there you go. These go to Ottawa at least once a day. Not all of them go to the minister, all of them go to CNS and DNS and the headquarters of policy people. Now, right, that stamp there. So when Dyer sent it from Halifax, that's the, uh, the to and fro he puts on it. This was added in headquarters, okay? And when you see the original, you can see it's almost stamped on. So on Dyer's original, which I think other historians have seen, that isn't there. And the, the original that's in headquarters, that is there. And I assume the same would be the same for RCF headquarters in Ottawa. Now, and here's the other key thing, okay? Intent. So here, Dyer is telling uh, Rainer, intent supporting from Sydney six trackers from Shearwater, deployed Sydney in support of Marlex, which is the cover story which I'll get to. In naval signaling, and the way naval decision-making transmission works, and this goes back to before the First World War, I don't think it goes back to Nelson. If I'm the, the Lieutenant Commanding of Corvette in Valley Atlantic in 1942, and I think there's a U-boat out there off the convoy five miles out, I will flash to the senior officer in 10 chasing down contact. If he doesn't want you to do that, he'll say, don't do that, stay in your station, okay, it's bogus or whatever. If he doesn't answer it, you do it, okay. So in naval signaling, intent is huge, because it means, if you don't tell me not to do this, this is what I'm doing. And Dyer's signals are full of intent, 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 intent. In other words, to Admiral Rayner, this is what I want to do, tell me if you don't want me to do it. Now, the signals from Ottawa to Halifax haven't survived, so we don't know how often Rainer told him. I don't think he did. They also talked on the phone, so it could have been discussed there. But that's the whole, so then this proves headquarters is involved. Here's another one. This is a, this is a typical contact report, okay, sent from the coast to Ottawa. And again, so that's Dyer, that's Naval Headquarters, that's it. Headquarters, that's Norfolk, okay, and again you see the copy, CNS, Vice CNS, policy guys, controller, worried about money, intelligence obviously, minister, associate minister, so again there it is. So these four in black were sent, I believe, every day, and a four in black is the submarine picture, a four in white is the surface picture. So all this is, and I'll show you something else about this later, this is just a contact report from an Argus coming back from a patrol. Okay, but look at the details there, it's everything. They catch this guy, or they actually didn't catch him, it wasn't a submarine there. But they're giving all the contact information they have. And I'll go through that again a bit later. Okay, so again, Ottawa is involved in not just what he intends to do, but they know what's going on out in the oceans off, off Halifax. And this will go on to uh, Admiral Brock's plot. Okay? There was one hiccup, and I think this is where the, uh, the impression that there was inaction in headquarters comes from. When Khrushchev announced on 28 October he was taking the missiles out, there was a sense among the people and among the military that the crisis was over, okay? And from a maritime sense, it wasn't. Due to concerns over increased expenditures, and it's 
true, because there was a financial crisis in Canada at that time, the Chiefs of Staff and the Deputy Minister who sat on the Chiefs of Staff's committee directed Admiral Dyer through Admiral Rayner, so they told Rayner to tell Dyer to revert to scheduled maintenance, training, and operational programs. In other words, stop the extra operations that are going on because of the crisis, because that's driving up fuel costs, and that's what it's all about. Okay. With support of Air Commodore Clements and Vice Admiral Taylor, Dyer argued that a maritime threat still existed in the form of submarines down near Cuba, and the USN was maintaining their effort. After a few days, the Chiefs of Staff confirmed, quote, the state of readiness of the RCN would depend upon that in force for associated US naval forces. That is why I think records were destroyed, because that is essentially saying that the Americans are controlling our decision-making process, and we were following their orders. If you're a weakening politician, you will think that, okay? So for the duration of the crisis, the Canadian maritime effort continued to match that of the Americans. All right, this will be that threat. Missile boats. Uh, early 60s, the, the Soviets were known to have about 400 to 500 submarines. Okay? NATO, the RCN, the USN was confident of their ability to stop <coughs> submarines conducting typical Second World War battle of the Atlantic sea warfare. They were not at all confident in their ability to stop missile boats. Oh, excuse me. <coughs> the big concern was that the Soviets would launch missile boats to North America, they would sit off our coast the way they had to do it, but they'd have to surface, they'd have to be on the surface for 15 minutes, they'd have to be within 250 miles of their target, and they could launch missiles. Okay? Uh, we had two types of exercises, beaver dam and slam axes, which trialed against these very threats. And it's quite amazing to, to read these reports, exercise analyses, because they would use USN submarines or British submarines, they would adopt missile pro profiles, they'd use about eight of them, okay? and they would approach the coast, and they would surface for 50 minutes, they would stand there, tick, 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 okay, and they would key in on the radio, missile launched. In most cases, they would get about one out of eight of those submarines. Okay, so stopping missile boats is very different from convoy warfare because you have to find the boat first, and you have to get it while it's on the surface before it launches. And as we know from recent news, it's very hard to find a submarine these days. Missile boats, the, we're still not sure how many the Russians had at that time. And these are conventional boats. These aren't nuclear boats. Um, it's less than a dozen. It's more than six. It's somewhere in there. They didn't adopt regular patrols in North American waters as they did later in the 60s. So one would come over intermittently, and it wasn't automatically replaced by another. On October 22nd, just before the crisis erupted, the U.S. Neptune aircraft photographed the Zulu Misu boat alongside this tanker near the Azores. Okay? Now this is where the history of this gets interesting. Until about five years ago, historians assumed that that Zulu, after it refueled, and because the crisis had started, came back into the Western Atlantic and sat off North America. And we now know from Russian sources that is not what happened, that it went home. Okay. The important thing about that is this. And as when you're a historian, you find some real neat stuff. And I wrote, this concerns intelligence during the crisis that there were no Soviet missile boats in the North Atlantic during the crisis. And you go through some signals, and there's one from Admiral Anderson, who runs the US Navy at that time, to Admiral Rayner. And it's copied in the back of Peter Hayden's book from, uh, from Air Force headquarters quarters to Air Commodore Clement. And it says, there are no Soviet missile or nuclear boats in the North Atlantic. It doesn't say there might not be. It doesn't say there may not. It's, it's, it's there are none. And you read that and you go, because all the other stuff, and this is very fuzzy about submarines. And my own pet theory here, and this is, I'll never put this in a book, but I'll say it to you. Uh, shortly after the crisis, a very senior Soviet official was taken out of the Kremlin and executed. And if you read certain accounts, he was a NATO spy. And that's the sort of thing that a spy would deliver to the Americans, that there are no missile boats, because that's the first thing the Americans would want to know. Because if there's no missile boats there, then that changes the threat. So. And then there's these guys, and this is all new. Um, I call it the unappreciated threat. 
And this is Soviet fishing vessels, which is actually trawlers, tankers, oilers, fishing factory ships, tugs, and intelligent vessels, or we call them AGIs. And they, I've seen them out there in North Atlantic, and that's typically what they look like. They're little rusted out things. And it's an escalating threat. So since in May 1957, whoops, in May 1957, they started to appear in the Grand Banks. There were 20. Summer 62, there's 300. Okay? And if you count the distance from the Grand Banks down to Cuba, there's 600 of these things. Okay? And more importantly, they're starting to behave truculently. That's according to naval intelligence. And what I mean by truculent is they're going into harbors without uh, announcing their arrival. They're using their radios in harbors, which you're not supposed to do, long-range radios. They're uh, entering coastal waters when they're not supposed to. Uh, some sailors on fishing boats were seen wearing naval off, uh, officers' uniforms. There's all these things. It's just behavior. They're getting more aggressive during exercises. So this threat is growing. And of all the things that when you read Dyer's stuff, this is freaking them out, quite honestly. This is what they could do. This is, you know, get, this will put you in the cold war. It's wonderful. They can monitor the activities of warships. Okay, we know they do that. You've seen all these shots of these guys in the middle of exercises, and they, they still do that. They jam, they thought they'd jam communications networks to the point, and this is an open document, that Strategic Air Command was concerned that trawlers off Newfoundland and off Nova Scotia could intercept and jam the communication between SAC tankers and SAC bombers. And the tanker bases were mainly at Stevenson, Phil, Newfoundland, and Goose Bay. And they were concerned that when the balloon went up and we're sending SAC over to get them, they'll jam the tanker communications and they won't be able to hook up. Now, radar will solve some of that, but that's sort of how paranoid they're getting. There was concern fishing vessels could provide guides to submarine launch missiles. So if you're 250 miles off in, in the fairly primitive guided missiles they had then, you would like to have, you didn't have to have, you'd like to have somewhere 100 miles in, a vessel or something to give guidance to that missile. Okay, so they were concerned that they would do that. They were concerned they would destroy the SOSIS, the Ballistic Missile Earning Warning System Network, by landing commandos or cutting cables. And I'll talk a bit more about cutting cables. So the, the main BMU's network runs from Greenland across to Baffin Island, and there's concern they're going to cut those cables. And they were fairly certain they knew where the SOSIS stations were. And I've seen that in documents that we think they know. They would surprise navigation, logistical support to submarines, refueling mainly, but other stuff. And that they also might mine harbors. So this is a pretty big threat. And again, 600 on the, the, the North America. So what Dyer had to, to get rid of these things, actually, let me just take a look ahead. No, okay. Yeah, I'll get that. Typical incidents. So on three occasions, 1961, Soviet trawlers were suspected, and I use that word, suspected, okay, of cutting the BMU's cables between Greenland and Baffin Island. And this is from intelligence reports that are open. Intelligence officers were unsure whether or not this action was intentional, but noted that fishing vessels were almost invariably present when breaks occurred. Okay, but these things were cut. There's no question about that. About the same time, an RCF maritime patrol aircraft photographed a Soviet trawler on the Grand Banks with a length of transatlantic cable draped over its stern. Okay, I tried to find this photograph. Okay, and you, this is used in about five assessments of the threat, this one incident. And you think, well, geez, they're fishing, so it's a fishing net. But I gathered that the, the, uh, the uh, quality of the, photo, the image was such that they could tell this was a cable in the back. But I guess the stern of the trawler was weighed right down in a wash in the ocean. So I don't know that they saw hacksaws out there, but anyways. But this is my favorite. This is the paranoia of this time period. And, and it's fair paranoia. These things were called Texas Towers. And there were three of them established off the northeast coast of the United States. Two on George's Bank and one on, on Long Island Sound. And what they were, were long-range radars to pick up Soviet bombers, okay? And as you can see, it's run by the United States Air Force. In 1961, or 60, I believe, there is a severe storm, and the one in Long Island Sound capsized, and about 25 crew members died. So they decided, well, in future in storms, we'll pull the sail, the airmen, sorry, I'll call them sailors at sea, we'll pull the airmen off these things for their own safety. 
And then this concern goes up. According to maritime law, and these are in internet, these are in international waters, okay? If they've been capsized for weather conditions, a Soviet vessel can grab that, salvage. Okay? So there is seriously, this is I'm not making this up. They are concerned the Soviet vessel, much like that one, would grab one of these things and tow it back to the Soviet Union, and legally they could do that. Okay? So that's the state of concern about what's going on in, in the Northwest Atlantic at this time. Dyer's proposed countermeasures, okay? So he wants to establish, and this is from a document in June 1962. He wants to establish a dedicated coordination center to track these 300 trawlers. That's probably impossible to do. He wants to have three permanent surveillance patrol craft of disguised fishing vessels manned by RCMP officers to mingle amongst them and find out what they're doing. Sort of like cue ships in the First World War. He wants to arm the trackers, the T-birds, and the Neptunes with air to surface rockets. And I think, as far as I'm aware, the trackers certainly were later, if not then, and the Neptunes, perhaps. None of these were implemented by the time the crisis broke. Okay? So all Dyer had to take on these 300 fishing vessels who could do all these various things were the guns of the surface fleet, which is about 38 vessels. Okay? And uh, so that's a little difficult. This, I, this is me being me. This is the lost solution. <laughs> The Banshee aircraft, fighter aircraft, four 20 millimeter cannon, air to surface rockets, that could do the fishing fleet very nicely. However, the last one left Shearwater in the summer of 1962. I was a kid living there. I saw it go over, I'll never forget. Beautiful airplane, beautiful airplane. So I'm sure Dyer wished he had those. And this is me being a silly historian. In 1963 and 1965, the Navy went after A4D Skyhawks. They ran trials in 63, they discovered it could fly up on a venture. And in the last naval board meeting before unification in, in 1965, they said they wanted to procure 24 Skyhawks. And it's never made sense to me until I read that fishing stuff and we didn't have banshees and I went, maybe that's why. Because the RCF didn't have assets that could handle fishing vessels and the Navy wanted them. I don't know why they didn't state that, I could be wrong, but it's, there's a possibility. All right, let's look at operations. I love that picture. I've had about four different versions of what that flag means. None of them really important. When you do naval operations, maritime operations, you have to start with the weather. Okay? Hurricane Ella went through these waters a week before the crisis. Okay? And the naval guys out there referred to one of them called them unrelenting gales. And I think we're looking about this for about three weeks. And if you're on a naval warship, um, that makes life very difficult. It impairs your sensors. It makes you very, very tired. It's hard on equipment. Okay, so it's a factor throughout. Uh, I don't think it affected air ops very much in terms of mounting the operations, but it would affect their ability to pick up radar hits off the surface. There's a lot of wave noise associated with that, which can affect sonar. And it's so there's a there's an influence. And if you tie that in with the Typically difficult water conditions in the Northwest Atlantic, sonar doesn't work very well off our coasts. Okay, so there's layering. It's a real problem. So those are a factor. This is the backbone to the whole thing. This is the SOSA system. Okay? Uh, this is very, 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 very secret 1962. We were concerned with that station, that's Argentia. Ours at Shelburne, and that one at Nantucket. Later in the operations, we were concerned about that one, which is off, uh, it's called Luz, Delaware. That's uh, Cape Hatteras, and of course, Bermuda, okay? But you see how the chain goes almost as completely north and, and east of Cuba. So when the, the Russians did send their four foxtrots there, the Sosis was ready, okay? Um, this had never been tried fully before the Cuban Missile Crisis, okay? The odd, Soviet submarine had come over, but I believe the first firm SOSIS confirmed contact was 1961. So we're dealing with, with new warfare here, new sensors. Okay? And uh, it didn't work out as expected as we'll see. This is Shelburne, okay? Um, I, I ran into a guy who's a retired USN SOSIS analyst named Bruce Rule, very well known. Um, I asked him, I said, are all SOSA stations equal, or can one perform better than another? He says, oh, they're completely different. He says, it depends a bit on equipment, but analysts of one, through leadership, can be better. And this guy, Commander Fred Jones, whoops, excuse me. 
Yeah. Fred Taylor, that should be Fred Jones, um, was the commander of Shelburne for about five or six years, RCN, promoted from the lower deck. He's a Sosa star by the Americans. They loved him. After he gave up command of this and did regular naval stuff, they killed, they still called him to do Sosa's analysis up in Norway and places like that. He was really good. Unknown. This is really me. I, this is my favorite part of the everything I can tell you tonight. Nav facts are Sosa stations, okay? The only nav fact was lady plotters, female plotters, and analysts was Shelburne. In the United States Navy, and it was from the start, we learned during the Second World War that Wrens were really, really, really good at plotting and analyzing plots. I don't know why, but it it's, continues to this day. If you ask a naval admiral today, they will tell you the same thing. Nobody knows why, but it's true. Okay? In the United States Navy, when you perform well, you get an E for excellence. Okay, So it, in exercises or something, if your engineering department performs well, you'll see an E on the side of the warship or your gunnery department or something, your air department, a carrier, you'll see this E. So it's a very sought after thing. I asked this guy, I said, did Shelburne win any E's? And he says, they did. They won at least two that he's aware of. And he says, I can't document this, but I'm pretty sure they won more, but there was such jealousy that the men were in the naval systems, the American naval systems were beat by women, they put them in second place instead of first. So I just love that. I put pressure there for, um, the thresher was lost in 62, and it was the information from Shelburne that, that gave the best information as to what happened, and she wasn't the closest station. Okay. So we're good at sources. Ostroms are important. I just want to say this. There's ostroms in Halifax and Ottawa. Halifax, obviously. The one in Halifax is interesting because you have maritime air controllers who are Air Force, and you have naval controllers who are naval officers, obviously. Uh, the naval controllers were not cleared for SOSAs, okay? The Air Force guys were. And that's because the initial agreements over SOSAs, they didn't think surface ships would have a role. So the agreements between that we signed with the Americans was only for air and the SOSA station, not for ships and the SOSA station. Therefore, naval officers were not aware. That changed. But so in the in the actual Halifax Ops Room, and I've got this from the RCAF air controller, there was a separate segregated section which only the Air Force guys could see, the Navy guys could not, because they weren't cleared for SOSAs. So the Navy guys never had the picture. Okay, Dyer would have for sure, because he was cleared for SOSAs, but the general watch officers in the naval plot did not. They had been scheduled to run Beagle 2, and this is pure serendipity, uh, about the same time the Cuban crisis happened. They were gonna work with the Americans, so the Americans had warships slated. We had a large number of aircraft and, and warships slated. They were all ready to go. They were trained up. Lease cycles were all set. So the Navy was operationally ready when the crisis came, just by, just by a fluke. And I just put this there to, to underscore that what I'm going to talk about is essentially a maritime surveillance operation. Okay, we're not at war. Okay? We could be at war very soon, but we're not at war. So what they're about is finding every Soviet asset they can find and trying to divine its intent. Okay? They're obviously most concerned about missile boats for obvious reasons, okay? nuclear warheads. But they just want to create a surface maritime picture. Let's start with MPAs. And that's the start. I mean, of, of what Canada did during the Cuban Missile Crisis, that's the start. The Americans had nothing like that. Didn't, didn't have aircraft with the range, with the sensors, uh, with, I would say, the quality of the crew also. The P-3 Orions were just starting to come on stream when Cuba happened, so I think a few of them are operational, but it's not a full squadron, I don't think. So these guys are, are very, very, very important. It's been very hard to come up with these numbers, trust me. They flew to Greenwood and Summerside. 24 aircraft in total were involved. Our total strength was 36. I don't think it was in 62. There were only two aboards during that time, over 22 days. 1,500 flying hours, 17 hours from the average sortie. So that's a pretty heavy toll. And this is what they did. I fell in love with PowerPoint. Okay, so they did three main areas. So the Stonewall sub area, and I'll talk about each of these in turn after. So that's one area, then the Halifax Op area, and then later they did this. Okay, these are the Sosa stations. There, 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 and there, and there. The likely Soviet transit for submarines is along the Great Circle route, 
Okay, so they follow that path, which is why the barrier is like that. I put that there because the stuff I've seen in open sources indicates that the barrier that was set up and it lasted throughout the entire operation wasn't supposed to. The, the intent was it to move it to the GIAC gap, Greenland, Iceland, UK, because that's where Soviet submarines had to come and it's a better choke point. They didn't do that, and I don't know why. My only guess is that if they had done that, they would have to involve the British. Okay, if you run that, it's just the Canadians and the Americans, and we have a whole bunch of different bilateral agreements than we, they did with the Brits. Okay, we knew things about what the Americans were doing, the Brits didn't know. Okay, so that to me is probably why they didn't advance that to the GL gap. If more had started, it would have for sure. Okay. All right, Stonewall. So there it is. That's the major focus of the Argus during the crisis. It's 650 miles into the northwest Atlantic. You can see there's the Argentius Sosis. So it's obviously working with Sosis. This area here is 10 US Navy conventional submarines. Okay? I think that's about a 50 mile corridor that they're looking after. This is US Navy Neptunes flying out of Argentia. Okay, over there. They didn't have the range to get there, so Taylor asked uh, Dyer to do that. And that's what the Argus' main effort was. Uh, a Willy Victor, that's the constellation. So I think the communications went from the submarine to Argentia, to the Willy Victor, to the aircraft. Okay, so they're the shuttle between comps. Typically, one Argus covered an area in front of three or four submarines. And total flight operations were 120 hours a day in that area, there by US and Canadians. And we did 43 barrier patrols in 22 days. Okay, so that's a lot. Okay, so that's the main activity. Um, there are no reports of any submarine contacts, period, during that time. If I go back, I just want to show you one more thing. Um, I forgot to mention those two. We had two Royal Navy submarines under our operational control. We had a loan agreement with the Royal Navy from the mid-50s. We controlled their movements. Okay. So they were eventually sent out northeast of the barrier and they sat out there. Okay. So remember that, I'll we'll come to them. Uh, I was, it's funny, the BBC did a big series about uh, four years ago where they unearthed a lot of intelligence about what their submarines during the Cold War. And they heard there were two Royal Navy submarines involved in the Cuban Missile Crisis. And they called me up, is this true? Yes, they were. What were they doing? Well, they were under Canadian operational control. That was the end of it. They didn't care. Okay, because they weren't their submarines, they were our submarines, so they didn't write anything about it. I was a little upset with that. My mother's English, I can say these things. This is Bravo Sierra, this is later, so this starts at uh, the end of October. So the crisis, Khrushchev has said we're getting our missiles out, okay? The Americans are still focusing down in the Caribbean, we'll get to that. And they asked, uh, they asked Dyer if he could contribute to this. And you can see where it is, this is outside Canadian zone, it's, it's southeast of New York City. This is a pretty important corridor. I don't know why they did it, okay? Why that patrol? Because it's a very specific area, okay? I'm guessing it's because of the SOSIS. My friend Sean Maloney tells me there's a very important uh, SAC establishment inland and out there, which would be a logical missile target. Uh, anyways, I'm guessing it's the SOSIS thing. Dyer eventually rotated an Argus into the patrol area for alternate 24 hour periods, staged for Brunswick, Maine, and Kwanzaa Point, and they did about 57 hours of patrol. Again, there were no submarine contacts, there was one, and they said it's Russian, they said no, it's an American submarine. So that was after the crisis they found out. And any surveillance off the Halifax op area, okay? Uh, and I'll get to that after. And I put B 32 there, that's a submarine contact. Um, because it shows the mysteries about these things. So I call this the mystery B-32. On 28 October, it was detected by Jezebel from an Argus, held it for 17 minutes, designated B-32. Until now, historians thought that was probably either the Zulu they thought came west, or it was a fishing vessel. I think it was a fishing vessel part of the time. Then my partner Jason Delaney found a document that said Skipjack was out there, USS Skipjack. And uh, I think it was mentioned in a signal we have. And we weren't sure what it would be doing, but it didn't really surprise us. But the Americans don't talk about things. So I, I got on, I sent an email to my American Navy colleague, and I said, you know, we have 
have this thing. I think I sent a clock and said, you know, here's Skip Jack. Uh, can, can you enlighten us on this? <coughs> Never got an answer because they don't comment on some main operations. Okay? And then we found another piece of evidence. I think it might have been a Wikipedia for goodness sake. Anyway, that's not good enough. And the executive officer of Skip Jack was smart enough to put out a book last year, which I was smart enough to buy because I knew him. And he said, we went through this zone in the middle of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Thank you very much. Confirmation. <laughs> so now I can show you that, you see? Before that book, I couldn't have. But these are the mysteries about submarine contacts. Trackers, okay? 14 were in Bonaventure, who was over in England at the time. We'll get to that. Uh, there were another dozen or so at, uh, at Shearwater. It depends upon the time, how many they had, because they had various squadrons doing various things. Six were sent from Shearwater up to Sydney, and then those repositioned to Torbay, and they flew inshore patrols in support of surface groups. Special surveillance flight, look at that beautiful aircraft. Matt Yost has written a really good article about this. Uh, I don't think he knew why though. NORAD was concerned the Soviets were going to cut the beam used cables, I told you, between Greenland and Baffin Island. Suspicious fishing vessels had been sighted off Belle Isle Strait in the Atlantic, and they could name them. NORAD requested patrol, okay? Navy didn't do it, Dyer didn't do it. NORAD said, we want to check what's going on up in Davis Strait. Okay, so the assignment went to this Lancaster. They postponed a number of times because of weather, and then off they went. And this, is, uh, this isn't the exact route, I just put this together, I'm guessing. Uh, they launched from Torbay, flew all the way to Frobisher Bay, overnighted there, went up into Cape Dyer. The cables come across sort of like this. Okay, so they're checking out for Soviet vessels up there. And then they flew all the way back down to Goose Bay. Quite a flight, 11 hours each leg. Uh, about the same, the aircraft flew to Berlin, I would say, during the war. Uh, no Soviet vessels appeared, but there were some 200 images of various fishing vessels. None of them are said to be Russian. Okay, so there you go. Surface deployments. Okay, again, we have no reports from these vessels. There's one, uh, and no lock orders. But they had three objectives surveillance of the fishing fleet protection of sources, but they didn't know that, okay? So they're protecting something they don't know exists. So I'm sure they scratch their heads, why are we here, but that's why they were there. And they also formed many AS barriers to back up Stonewall. Bonaventure, so that's our best anti-submarine asset outside the Argus. Uh, by planning, I think, three years old, she was over in UK for a NATO exercise with five destroyers. This is the problem of having one of anything when you're in a naval environment. If you have one carrier and it's in refit or it's across the ocean, you don't have a carrier. Just saying that. It's from my father. It was recalled very quickly from, from Britain on the 25th and it, whoops, and it arrived back in the second. She had to come back slowly because her escort was second of war destroyers that had to be refueled. And they had very f poor fuel economy, so they could only do about 15 knots. Okay? As soon as the tractors were within range of, of, of uh, Maryland Tower, Operation Larry, they flew in short patrols on their way home. And this is where surface groups were. So each one of these letters is a, is a Cortron, Can Cortron, Can Escort Squad. So C9 is frigates up there. Again, there's the Sosa Station. Okay, there's the Stonewall Barrier. So she's in front of that. Another frigate group, inshore routes. Cortron 5 is protecting the Sosa Network there near Sable Island. George's Bank, because there's two of those radars there, the Texas Towers on George's Bank. Uh, and a lot of the Soviet fishing fleet is right there. And of course, there's a Nantucket Sosa Station. Okay. We had no refueling and sea capability except for Bonaventure. Okay, so this is the Cape Scott. She could not do it except one vessel at a time very, with very old methods, which is a very long time. And in the sea conditions, you saw it just wouldn't work. Uh, so they put her in Shelburne. They ran this auxiliary tanker between Shelburne and Halifax to keep her topped up with fuel, and the destroyers and frigates went into Shelburne or St. John's during the crisis. This reduced their capability by 25% by having to send these guys in and out. If you had an AOR there, you locked out. One Cancord Tran is five. These are Nipigon class destroyers. These were the best ships we had on the uh, on the East Coast. They were the ready group at the time. So there's one squadron still to this day, only a ship now instead of a squadron, who asked within 24 hours notice to go out 
lucky for us was these guys, so these are the best. So off they went. Um, HMCS Kootenai was one of them, um, aggressive. Pat Ryan was the captain, commander Pat Ryan, uh, a real nice man, very hyper aggressive guy. He talked to me, jump up and down, he'd get full of adrenaline. Uh, he was the captain of Kootenai. He used to go alongside fishing vessels. He did this at least twice, and I'm guessing more. And uh, that search radar right there is extremely powerful. Like, you don't turn it on in Halifax Harbor because you load every microwave in the city, okay? So Pat would go within about 500 yards of a Soviet fishing vessel and light up the radar. And he'd blow every circuit in that fishing vessel. Now, at a time of tension, I don't know if that's the best thing to do, but that's what he, that was his little thing. We also had two frigate groups. Again, they were off, uh, off uh, Cabot Street and off uh, St. John's. Okay. Uh, old warships, slow warships, um, they were okay. Cancor Tron 3, they were doing workups, okay? So they were sent out to George's Bank during workups. And uh, they were looking for three specific vessels, okay? And the names are there. You're looking for these guys. Two were fishing vessels, one was a transport of some sort. And there's dozens of fishing boats at the time. Okay. I put this in because when you're watching fish, fishing vessels at a time of crisis, you tend to put motives, assign motives to them that may not be there. And if I've been at sea and I've seen Russian fishing vessels, not so did the Russians, and they move in formations and they fish in formations. And it's very easy to interpret that as covering a submarine, perhaps, or having some nefarious military purpose when actually they're just fishing. Okay? And Tony Law wrote the only report that's really survived. He was a Second World MTB guy, colorful man, great artist, actually, very famous artist. And this report is, is, explains the problem the surface groups had during the crisis. Okay, so he's on George's Bank. Um, he's been there for about three days, so he's tired. And the seas are like this. Don't forget the seas. Sue encountered fishing vessels acting as though they were trying to disrupt the DD search, the destroyer's search. Law noted, quote, two possible conclusions are drawn from their maneuver. A, the maneuver could have been designed to confuse the contact area and disguise, disguise the presence of a Soviet submarine, or what is far more likely, be the factory trawlers with their fishing locating equipment had detected the same school of fish as Sue and were coming to get some of it. In other words, they're fishing, okay? And the contact proved non-sub, which enabled parlance as fish, so they were just fishing. And the other thing is, George's Bank is an extremely shallow piece of, uh, of water, and it's not a good place to operate in some ways. But such incidents were very typical throughout the crisis, and created this picture that there were submarines everywhere when there weren't. I can't print any Russian scholars here, Okay, that's the Cheval, I'll call it. She, that's not her, that's her sister ship, but that's what she looks like. Uh, she was a known Soviet AGI intelligence vessel. They had it located off Cape Hatteras at the start of the crisis, then they lost her. Okay, and this is the Americans lost her. And there's great concern about where she is because they don't know what she's going to be doing. And they think she's supporting submarine operations. An Argus founder on 4th November, so we're... Uh, three weeks into the crisis almost, up near the Stonewall Barrier, okay? Dyer dispatched a frigate to shadow her, and a frigate, they found her finally, and they followed her for three weeks everywhere she went, okay, because they were concerned. Now remember, I, they said, we think there's submarines everywhere, okay? So she was thought to be doing, um, supporting submarines. A SAC plant briefing that one of our senior officers was at and wrote in a memo, which was cleared, luckily, Noted that Cheval appeared to be moving to support Russian submarines, although this course of action did not develop. So there's another sign about Russian activity with submarines may not be there. Final deployments at the end. And you have to remember, there's four Foxtrot submarines confirmed down near Cuba, okay? They made three of them surface, so they know they're, they're there. The fourth one, they caught her on snorkel, okay? So they know they're there. Okay. These are the lads with the nuclear torpedoes. Um, they were very concerned about where they were going to go, even after Khrushchev said, pull the missiles. Okay. 
So that affected our employment. So let's start with these guys. So we put a Canadian destroyer group. The Americans asked us for Canadian destroyers. These were under American operational control. Okay? Not Dyer's, he gave them up. Okay? He chopped them, as it said, to the Americans. And I think that's another reason records were destroyed. Okay? They worked about uh, four days in that little area there. I talked about the Bravo 2 Sierra. Okay? Bonaventure, after she got back on November 2nd, uh, was a few days in harbor, then nested about down here for a couple of days, and then headed, I don't know where she headed, but the clues I have say she's there. I mean, her report says left Halifax November 2nd, came back on December 3rd. That's all, okay? The squadron report from 880 says the same thing. There are no operational details. I found other sources. I know they're doing anti-submarine stuff, and the reason they're doing it is one of the possible egress routes for these four foxtrots leaving from the south would be west of Cuba, or sorry, Bermuda. As it turned out, they were sighted refueling out here somewhere. But Bonaventure and the four escorts are down there doing that. But again, that's well outside of the Canadian zone. Okay, so they're supporting the Americans directly. Let's end up Quebec. On the 10th of November, Dyer visited Norfolk to discuss reduction of operations with Vice Admiral Taylor. Dyer established two surface surveillance groups. These didn't exist before the crisis. They existed for about a month. Yeah, Alpha and Bravo. One was at sea, one was in Halifax. So he kept a small force out there uh, because he thought the maritime threat continued. Okay. Uh, Taylor dismantled the Stonewall barrier on the 13th of November. Okay. And so that's essentially the end of the operation with Mum's the word. That's a little burn bag there, just for artistic effect. Uh, the rule was kept completely secret. Okay, documents were destroyed. Alec Douglas, uh, Dr. Douglas, I, I was hoping he'd be here tonight, formal naval historian. He was the ops officer with one of the frigate groups. He recalls very well when he left the ship, you destroy every signal dealing with Cuba. Okay, so that happened in every ship, in every command, everywhere. Okay, there was no national mention. Okay. Roundell, Crow's Nest magazines, there's nothing. Okay, I love it. There's nothing. Okay, it only became widely known through the work of Peter Hayden, my good friend, and the Tony Grimm in the early 1990s finally cast a light on it. Until then, I mean, you could hear rumors of it, but it was never, uh, it was never laid out in full. There's a ton of lessons associated with this. Uh, the main one that I've come, I'll talk about submarines in a second. When you put a large group of warships and a large, large amount of air activity, you can learn operational cycles, there's a lot of signaling. We know through CIA documents that have been released that the Soviets had a field day picking up naval and air force transmissions during the crisis. Okay? They read all sorts of stuff. They're not, gonna, they're not gonna understand what it says necessarily, well they might have, I don't know, but for traffic analysis and understanding where we're gonna deploy in such a condition, situation, that's gold intelligence. It's, of course, we got the same thing. Okay. So that was one thing. We also learned about uh, cycles of submarines. I won't say much about that. Okay, so this is the most important lesson of this whole thing. This is Admiral Dyer. This is a report. There's a senior officers conference at Naval Service Headquarters after the, uh, I think it's in December or January. And Dyer says, SOSIS was not as successful as had been hoped. And this is why. Okay, to run SOSIS, you get low frequency signatures of noises, okay? And you catalog them into type, okay? It turned out after the crisis, okay, the only signatures they had in their library, which wasn't very big at that time, were of submarines running on the surface, okay? So that's Russian submarines running on the surface. They also learned that when Russian submarines snorkeled, okay, so they're a periscope depth, snorkeling, they only did it on one engine, okay? They also discovered, and this is it, that many Soviet fishing vessels, trawlers, AGIs, had identical diesel engines to Soviet conventional submarines. Therefore, they sound exactly the same. Okay? And SOSIS could therefore not discern the difference between a submarine and a fishing vessel. Okay? So many of the contacts that were thought to be submarines weren't. Okay? Now, uh, and that, that eroded confidence, huge, this is huge. Okay? God, it doesn't work. They spent billions of dollars into this thing, hush, hush. But in 1965, the Soviets, God bless them, ran two foxtrots around North Cape, 
in the northern Norway, and there was a new solar station, and I think they went two days apart, and they snorted, and the station got their signatures, and could, by studying them, they could tell the difference. So from that point, 65, they could identify Russian submarines. And from that point on, Solstice was gold. Especially with nuclear submarines, because nuclear submarines run pumps, and they make noises. This is from the Pentagon ASW plot on the 7th of November, 1962. Okay, So this is what they think the submarine picture is. Okay, So I'll go through these. B-28, that's the Zulu that was sighted refueling from Tarek. We now pretty sure it went home. Okay. B-32 was the one I mentioned that is Skipjack. B-35 was the one by Astute. Um, that turned out to be non-sub, which means fish probably. It was held like for 30 seconds. Okay. This B-36 was an ECM radar hit by our frigate Lozon, so we detected a Soviet radar, and it was the same type of radar used by Soviet submarines, which was also the same type of radar used by some Soviet surface vessels. Okay, so fishing boat, most likely. Uh, this one's really cool. E-58, they chased her around for about four days. Uh, it was either fishing vessels, and they thought that at the time, and then they say, no, 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 it's a submarine. And then they looked at uh, operational schedules as USS Toro coming out of the uh, quant, so, so sort of in the, that way. This was an American submarine. And B-34, I can't figure out what that was. Okay? So that's, that's what they think exists. And again, there's all the other ones down by Cuba. So here's the question I, I pose, and this is what I had to pose for the official history. Um, recent Russian and U.S. scholarship, Norman Palmer is a very good friend of mine, a very good American historian. He, the Russians like him, they have for years. So he has had access to Russian records, and they maintain both Russian sources and accounts that we have now that are good, we think, dependable, and U.S. guys who looked at Russian records and talked to Russians. The only submarines, whoops, were the four foxtrots off Cuba and the Zulu that went home. Okay, so five, that's it. Okay. From the evidence I have seen, and okay, I've seen, I don't think there are any Soviet boats in Canadian waters. Okay, I, I can't be fully sure of that because we used to say the same thing about U-boats, and then you look at German records, oh, there was one there after all. So I can't say that definitively until I see Russian records. I'm not going to. You know, we've, we got really close to getting into Russian records before Kosovo, and then the whole thing shut down. Uh, so we're not going to get that. So I don't think there were any Soviet submarines in our, in our area. However, and this is where I'm sticking my neck out, okay? If they actually were there, then we're not really good at any submarine warfare, are we? Because we didn't pick them up. We had fleeting detections that I showed you, but we didn't track any of those contacts. Okay? None of them were tracked for any length of time. So, and water conditions are tough, don't get me wrong. So either they weren't there, which is what I think, based on all sorts of information, or if they were there, we didn't find them, okay? And to end, uh, this is the effort, and to me, I use the word astonishing uh, not very often, and to me, this is astonishing. Uh, we blanketed that surveillance area, which is massive and terrible weather for three weeks. 29 of 38 of Maritime Command's warships and submarines were ready and available for action and went to sea, okay? That's 75%. In naval, that's huge. Usually you're looking at 50 to 66%. 75 is huge, so that's a really good effort. Only two of 98 Argus missions canceled, okay? Reported, two of them, that's amazing. From all accounts, morale was really high. And understand, these guys all have families ashore, and they're all concerned that Third World War is about to go up and it's going to be nuclear. So they have things on their mind that I've never, I've not seen one, because of every report you do see, there's no operational details, but there's always a statement about how the crew's reacting to anything. And in every case, every case of every warship I looked at, I don't know the Air Force, of every case of every warship, they say the morale is super, and this is important, and we're doing it. So, if Atlantic Command's response to the exceptional circumstance of the Cuban Missile Crisis can be seen as its most serious test during the Cold War, it can be judged who done its job. Thank you. Well, these are some sources. If you have a phone, you might want to take a picture of that. These are all on the internet. These are all open sources that are available. This one, 
uh, the national, this is amazing. Okay, it's called the Summary of Octobers. It's hundreds of signals, maps, charts, reports, all sorts, mainly American. There's some Russian stuff. It's, it's worth looking at. It's really, really cool. Uh, this is sort of a standard history. It tells you as far as the Americans can go talking about this stuff, which isn't very far, sadly. And Bruce Rule, he's the guy who ran SOSIS. And he was a SOSIS analyst for years, decades. And he's got a very keen mind, and he writes amazing stuff. And he's the one who told me about the issues with SOSIS confusing submarines for fish vessels. There you go. Thank you. Any questions? Q. Very odd one. I was sort of reminded from the maps that South Pierre and Miquelon are up there, and there's also a French naval presence. Were the French at all, at least in, a, uh, in the, the loop for information? I have to repeat your question. Uh, he wants to know about Saint Pierre and Miquelon and whether the French became involved. I, I look for that. There's nothing. No. I, I, I would be tempted to go through RG25, which is the external affairs uh, records, because I'm pretty sure they would have discussed that. Uh, as a NATO member, I mean, Kennedy told De Gaulle what was going on, right? So De Gaulle's in the picture. Uh, but there's no, as that I can see, any French military presence at all. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Yes, sir. I, I find your uh, the comment interesting that the Soviet diesel engines were identical almost to the uh, fishing vessel engines, and secondly, that our intelligence sources wouldn't have known that. Yeah, this is this is because SOSIS is brand new. Okay, uh, again, they've only run off. They, they just misinterpreted the thing. They assumed when 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 Fox trots or other submarines snorted, for example, they used two engines. Okay, so they wouldn't. Two engines sound different than one. Okay, and you can you can tell that difference, even in 1962. So that sounds like a fishing boat. They all just sound alike, and, and they didn't realize this. You, it is an intelligence failure, for sure. But they just, when, when you run operations like this, and there's a saturation, then you get, then you look at things more closely. If you assume SOSIS is going to work incredibly well, and it's, we've put all this money into it, my god, it's going to solve all the problems. You tend to think that's going to be the case, right? We see this in the military again and again and again, and then you're confronted by reality. And you have to give them great credit for, for looking at the reality and figuring it out, because they didn't have to figure it out, but they figured it out. And it's remarkable. Oh, yeah. yeah I, when I heard that, I went, whoa, because that, that changed everything. Because all these submarines based upon low fire hits by Argus's or Sosis, well, they think they're submarines because that's what their information tells them it is. Their books, but it's not. It could be a fishing vessel, could be a submarine, but it could be a fishing vessel too. Yes, sir. From the long same line. And yeah. I chased a uh, bearing line from Shelburne for years. Wow. Okay? And, they, and it sounds the same. The, the, the Soviets do things on a large scale. They have one big B 16 or whatever, and it goes into a Mayakovsky class. Fishery trawler, factory trawler, and the back, the back end of a box truck. Yeah. You know, so we go chasing down and run into another night of yeah. and, and, and they're running about the same speed, you see. That's the other part of this. They're, they're running about the same revolutions. Because if you've got, you got to admire the, the operator in the back, of, and I was in a tractor, and another in Argus. Mm -hmm. But the operator in the back is highly trained, and he can see by the trace, he can count the cylinders. So he knows it's a 16 or whatever, yeah. and the RPM, and from there we can, you know, work out a rough uh, speed and both the speed. Yeah. After Cuba, any submarine warfare, um, I think because it really focused their attention, um, made a great jump. Uh, narrow band sensors and things like that. It's uh, they're just starting to use submarines for anti-submarine warfare platforms. Okay, the Americans, I mean, they put ten of them out there. Okay, they're just starting to learn how to use those. Okay, so this this caused people to, I guess, to focus their attention. Would be the way to put it. Yes, sir. So Marlex was a cover story. That yes. Was, what was the story? The story was our ships are heading out for routine maritime exercises, which are called Marlexes, 
And it didn't fool anybody. It's a cover story. Because in Bedford, this, the, the ammunition jetty is right there. You can see it. And these ships are going to the ammunition jetty. I mean, uh, Pat Ryan, when he took Kootenai out of harbor, it was dusk, it wasn't dark. He didn't have his lights on. He turned his lights off, you know, which is silly. That's just Pat being Pat. So there's all these indications. The press was all over this. Uh, they, they said they were going to cancel leave, and then they didn't. They didn't cancel leave because they're all concerned about it. You see, if it becomes known that, that Dyer's command is rushing out to sea for an emergency and nuclear war is about to erupt, there's going to be public alarm, you know, obviously. So they wanted to low key. You see this in, in, the, uh, in the communications from Rainer to Dyer that they're trying to keep the lid on this, okay? And they, they, I guess they were successful. I mean, people knew they were going to sea. They probably knew what they were doing. They knew why they were going to sea. Uh, they didn't know exactly what they were doing, but they knew they were going to sea. You know? And in Halifax, when I was a kid, it was the best place to be a kid, you know, you'd see, I could see the dockyard from my house if I went down the street. Uh, you could see when it was empty or full. You know, and I was interested in warships, so I knew when they were in, when they were out. And it's, so they could tell it was out. You know, in Cape Scott, you know, what's she doing in Shelburne? You know, there's all these. So they knew what was going on, but they just didn't know the details. Yes, sir? I'm also ignorant of SOSA, so I don't Is it like, I assume it's like a passive sonar? Yes, SOSA is, is, is a series of cables, and I, I don't know how far they extend out from a, a they're anchored at a shore station, and their cables run out for dozens of miles, usually typically in shallow coastal areas, although not always. Uh, and there's different types of them, and they're, they're, they're low frequency analysis of sound. Right. Yeah. So passive yeah, passive sound. Yeah, passive sound. And it, it expanded greatly to the whole network after Cuba. They put it on the west coast, uh, Hawaii, Alaska. Uh, they developed this thing called SIRTAS, where they had big trawlers. I think this came in the 70s, uh, where they would tow SOSIS around the oceans. And, you know, amazing things. Glenn? Michael, about 2005, mm -hmm. the Americans hosted the Soviet captains of those submarines yep. and, um, at their war college. And I think it went on for some three or four days. Mm -hmm. Did any of that activity enter your... Uh, in for I've looked at it. Uh, I don't talk about it because it's not in our zone of operations, but I will talk about it. So what they did, the, the Soviet plan for Cuba never grew to fruition because it wasn't just to send four Fox Fox-Trots down there. It was to send two submarine squadrons down there, one armed with, with nuclear missiles. Okay, this was going to take place. This was called Operation Anadir. It was going to start in the fall of 62, and go into 63. There were going to be surface assets there. These were going to be based in Cuba, okay, permanent. They're staying there. Uh, the four Foxtrots were the first wave of this, and they canceled it after the missile crisis, okay? These Foxtrots were armed with, armed with one nuclear missile each. Uh, people generally think that's to take out carrier groups like Glenn was out in. I don't think that's the case. It's possibly the case. I think more likely the case would be to fire fired into Charleston Harbor, uh, Mayport, Jacksonville, uh, put a torpedo into a harbor. It's like an atomic bomb. Uh, I don't know which one. I haven't talked to a Russian about that. But they were they were down there, and uh, these guys, if their accounts are published, anybody wants to get in touch, I give the name of the book. Uh, I, I've lost it right now. Um, they're interesting. There's four of them. One was, one was your cautious guy who was very wary of the fact that he had a nuclear weapon on board. Uh, one of them comes across as a drunk who was sitting there stewing in vodka wanting to start World War III. A little scary. But it's world history. You have to be careful. But uh, they were uh, in terrible conditions, tropical waters, no air conditioning. If you read the accounts of these boats, and these are essentially World War II era submarines, U-boats essentially, uh, and the Russians don't look after their people at all, these were hellholes. Like, they were just awful. And they were submerged for days and days and days and days and days in tropical waters. When you're snorting at the best of times, it's a very uncomfortable experience because the pressure keeps changing. And so I, don't, I understand why they surfaced. There's another neat thing about this. Uh, and this goes to rules of engagement. So in the late 1950s, the Americans and Canadians wanted to have common rules of engagement for submarines. And the American strategy, policy, 
was, if we catch them near our shore, if they don't surface, we're going to sink them. And our attitude was, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to detect them and, and try to communicate with them. We're not going to sink them. And we're going to try to force them away. So during the Cuba Missile Crisis, and this is where these things get, we put our, when that RCN destroyer group went to American control, we insisted they be under Canadian rules of engagement. And that was the only control we had, Dyer said, our always. But there's another aspect of this which is really cool. So you may know that Secretary McNamara, when the crisis started, put out this notice to mariners, which is what you put out to let sailors know what's going on at sea. And the notice to mariners said, if Russian submarines are detected near our areas, not our territory, but our areas, we will drop five depth charges, practice depth charges on them to order them to surface. Okay, and this is what they did. So practice depth charges are essentially little hand grenades, a little bit more that you toss over this side, but they make quite a noise. Now, when you're an Argus up there, or a tracker up there, and you're using Julie explosive echo ranging, you're using a charge that's very, very similar to practice depth charge. Glenn's nodding his head, thank you. So, think about this. So you're, on the one hand, you have guys out there putting down five of these bombs saying, you can service now. On the other hand, you have Neptunes and Argus, American and Canadian and trackers, out there dropping Julie explosive devices to find them. Now, if you're a Russian submarine, if you tell the difference, no. You know, so that's, I, I read that and I go, geez, this is really dicey, the whole thing is dicey. We're very lucky we're still here. Yes, sir? You didn't say anything about Bermuda. Did they take five minutes? Yes, the, uh, the social station there did. Our ships never put into there that I can see. Uh, but certainly Bermuda, if you look at the northern area, and this, Bermuda to me is a dividing point to what we're doing, what the Americans are doing, with some Americans doing stuff north of Bermuda, for sure. But that's, we didn't go south of Bermuda, I don't think, except for Glenn. So. Yes, sir? Just one question. Did we have suffer any aircraft incidents or accidents as part of this exercise? I, I, I haven't seen any. As far as I'm aware, only two Argus's were lost in operational missions, uh, not during the human crisis. Their performance, I mean, flying 96 out of 98 sorties, that's, that's amazing. Like, that's, I mean, the ground crew, just think of that. And, and they're just a lot of hours. Any more questions? Thanks very much. Thank you.